Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mike and in this brief lecture I want to talk to you about the CRISPR-Cas9 system and how we can utilize it as an effective gene therapy. Now to begin we need to talk about the history of CRISPR-Cas9 and it all began the same year I was born, 1987. Researchers in Osaka, Japan identified in the bacterial genome of E. coli these clustered repeating segments of DNA that tended to be short but also palindromic which meant they were read forwards the same way they were read backwards. Now, they also found that these repeating palindromic segments of DNA were interspersed by spaces of DNA that seemed to be quite random. Now, 13 years later, other researchers identified these exact same clustered repeating palindromic sequences in other bacteria and even archaea. And today we know that they're present in up to 50% of bacteria and 90% of archaea. But back then we had no idea what these repeating segments and even the spaces between did. It took nearly 20 years from that original discovery to identify the fact that it wasn't these repeating segments that were interesting, but the spaces were interesting. Now, what we called this entire stretch of the repeats and the spaces were CRISPR. And CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. What these spaces were, were actually fragments of viral DNA. Researchers discovered that bacteria had a mechanism to be able to cut fragments of DNA from viruses that were infecting them and incorporate those fragments into their own genome as a memory to remember that invading virus. Effectively, what researchers had discovered was the bacterial version of the adaptive immune system. Let's now take a look at how this CRISPR system works and how we can utilize it for gene therapy. When a virus, like this bacteriophage here, attacks or invades a bacteria injecting its viral DNA, the bacteria, or archaea, has evolved a mechanism to be able to identify the viral DNA, chop up certain sequences, and incorporate it into its own genome as a memory of that virus. So an adaptive immune response. How does this work? So firstly, once this viral DNA is injected, the bacteria, or archaea, has this group of proteins, or enzymes called Cas1 and Cas2. So here we've got Cas1 and here we've got Cas2. What they do is they recognize a particular fragment of this viral DNA and they chop it. So it's going to cut it there and it's going to cut it there. What it cuts, this segment here we call a protospacer. We call it a proto Spacer. Now your question might be, where does it chop? Does it just chop randomly or at specific areas? It does chop at specific areas. It will identify a sequence or motif of DNA on this virus that we call a protospacer adjacent motif, also known as a PAM. And once it identifies this PAM region, it will cut a few base pairs upstream of it. So it's now created or cut this protospacer and it takes this protospacer and incorporates it into the bacterial genome. Once it's incorporated into the bacterial genome, it is now called a spacer. So here we have a spacer from a virus. We've also got another spacer here, which is from another virus. Now the areas in between the spacers, these are going to be the clustered palindromic repeats, that when a spacer is placed in, a clustered palindromic repeat is placed afterwards. So I'm going to call these repeats. Repeat and repeat. What we call this entire collection of DNA where we've got various repeats and we've got various spaces, we call this a CRISPR array. So this whole thing here is a CRISPR array. And so if we break that term CRISPR up, right, clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats. Clustered because it's in a particular 
grouping or area of DNA regularly interspaced. Repeat, repeat, repeat with these spaces in between. Short because they're only like 20 to 30 base pairs long, each of these things. Palindromic because the repeats read the same way forwards as they do backwards. So there we go, this is CRISPR, this is what we're referring to and here I've only got two spaces which means this one has actually come from this virus but this one will have come from another virus and as I said earlier some bacteria and archaea can have hundreds of these CRISPR, or hundreds of these spaces so very long CRISPR arrays. So the question is now what happens? Well, this is double-stranded DNA. Bacteria have circular double-stranded DNA. And what we need to do is we need an RNA polymerase to come into action. So an RNA polymerase, what do RNA polymerases do? They turn this DNA sequence, transcribe it into RNA. Now in humans, we would usually transcribe this into what we call messenger RNA, which is a message to be able to transcribe amino acids and therefore proteins, but that's not what's happening here. So this is not called messenger RNA, this is actually called pre-CRISPR RNA. So now we've got pre-CRISPR RNA, and as you can see, it is a stretch of repeats and spaces. Wonderful, that's what the RNA polymerase has done. Now, another RNA polymerase will go to another discrete area of the bacterial genome and actually transcribe other types of RNA. These RNAs that it actually creates or transcribes, parts of them match the repeats. Sorry, these parts here. So parts of it will match the repeats. So if we were to draw it up, what we're gonna have are these different sequences of RNA where parts of them match perfectly with the repeats and other parts don't. Like that. And so we can put the binding areas in like that and then other parts won't bind but then other parts will bind and then other parts won't. Now what these strands of RNA are called, they're called tracer RNA. These are called tracer, T-R-A-C-R, -R, tracer RNA. So what we've now transcribed is two RNA strands where we've got a pre-CRISPR RNA and then a tracer RNA that's bound to a repeat, but we've got multiple tracer RNAs. This is where we need to bring in an RNAase. So it's an enzyme that breaks up RNA. So what the RNAase does is it comes along, so this is the RNAase, it comes along and it will chop the spacer, and it will chop part of the repeat, like that. And it will do it at multiple areas. Now let's just do this one here, right? So we're using this particular spacer. So we've got the entire spacer, part of the repeat, and what it ends up looking like now is like this, where we've got the spacer, part of the repeat, and the tracer, which is bound to part of the repeat, and then we've got like a tracer tail, like that. So here we've actually got two separate types of RNA. We've got now, it's not called the pre-CRISPR RNA, we've got the CRISPR RNA. So we've now got CRISPR RNA, and we've got tracer RNA. And what comes along, the third thing we need is a protein, and this is called Cas9. So what Cas9 does is it's a protein that binds to these two RNAs. It binds like this. Where you've got the spacer sticking out, but embedded inside you've got part of the repeat and you've got the tracer. Now your question might be, why have we transcribed these tracer RNAs? We've transcribed them because the tracer holds on to the Cas9. That's what it does. It allows for this RNA to be able to bind into it. So these are the three things we now have. Now in actual fact, once the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA is inside of the Cas9, we can call it guide RNA. So we can actually call these two guide RNA T 
together once it's in the Cas9. G R N A. Now, in actual fact, if we were to look at this a little bit in a little bit more detail, it would look a little bit like this. So let's have the Cas9 protein, and then we're going to have the spacer like that. And then we're gonna have the repeat up like that. And then we're gonna have the tracer bound to the repeat with a little bit of a tracer tail like that. So still two separate, there's one RNA and there's another RNA. The two separate. This is where we start thinking about gene editing and gene therapy. What they discovered, these researchers, was that you can actually connect the two together and you create a single guide RNA. So it's no longer a gRNA, we can call it an sgRNA, a single guide RNA. And that means we can actually make this whatever we want. As long as it binds into the Cas9, we can manufacture in the lab a single guide RNA that tells this CRISPR protein, or this Cas9 protein I should say, where it needs to go in the genome. Because what its function is, is this. It, when we get invaded, let's just say, by another virus, and that virus incorporates its DNA, so let's say we've now got double-stranded DNA being injected by this virus, what this now does, the Cas9, is it comes along It has its spacer, and the spacer will be complementary to one of the strands of the virus, remember? And then we're going to have the part of the CRISPR RNA, or part of the repeat, and then we're going to have the tracer. And the point of what's happening here is once this guide RNA is bound to this viral RNA that's now been injected, it identifies where it needs to cut. It goes, okay, I've bound here, right at the end I'm gonna chop it up right there, and I'm gonna chop it up right here on the other strand. It breaks both strands. Cas9, chop, chop. And now what we're left with, once we've chopped it up, is this double-stranded break in the DNA. So we've now got DNA that's got this break, like that. Now what does that mean? This is viral DNA, this virus has invaded, but we've chopped it. Viruses don't contain their own enzymes to be able to fix this break. So that means the viral RNA or DNA has now been broken and it cannot be fixed. Brilliant. We've now inactivated the invading virus. What does this mean for gene therapy and gene editing? It's all about if this was in a human being, think about that, if we utilise this CRISPR technology with this Cas9 and the single guide RNA and we chopped a very specific part of our DNA like this, what does that now mean? Well think about it, humans actually contain two copies of every gene. So we've actually got another gene down here. for use. Now if we want to repair this break, what can happen is two different types of repair mechanisms. You can have what's called non-homologous end joining or you can have homology directed repair. Non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. So let's think non-homologous end joining. We want to fix this, this is inside of human, we've chopped it up. We've just chopped a gene up. What this does is the RNA polymerase that come along to try and fix this with non-homologous end joining, it just glues it together. And when it glues it back together, it sometimes can add a particular nucleotide or it might add a couple, or it might remove some nucleotides. It's not perfect. It's a bit of a messy way of connecting it back together. And often when that happens, it can inactivate that particular gene. And so what you can do is have a knockout. So often through non-homologous end joining and using CRISPR, we have a knockout model. We can turn a gene off. 
so we can inactivate it. Beautiful. What about if we use homology directed repair? If we use homology directed repair, what tends to happen is this. You've got this break in the DNA and it wants to try and fix itself. One of the strands can actually go to the other copy that we have. Remember, we inherit two copies of each chromosome, which means we have two copies of each gene. So even though we've chopped one, we've got a spare one here, it can come along and it can find its complementary strand using various types of enzymes. It can fill in the gaps, which means then it can go back to here where it's now got the gap filled up and use that as a template to fix it. This is a more, uh, this is a more accurate way of filling in the gaps and fixing the break. And what it tells us is this, you can use a template to fix it. That's important because we can put whatever template we want to insert any gene we want or any sequence we want. So we can actually perform a knock in, put a gene in and get it transcribed and translated. So through non-homologous end joining, we can do knockout, turning a gene off, and through homology directed repair, we can do a knock in and turn a new gene on. And using this, we can play around with the genome and play around with genes, and this can be used for gene therapy. This is how CRISPR is utilized. So the question we now need to ask ourselves is, how can we currently use CRISPR, and how can we use CRISPR in the future? Well, there's two major ways, and the first way is that of screening. So we can use CRISPR technology to screen specific genes to see in what way do they affect our physiology? So when it comes to genetic diseases, things like cancers, we don't actually know all the genes that are involved. We know that there's going to be genetic aberrations in oncogenes that tend to turn them on, or there's going to be aberrations in tumor suppressor genes which tend to turn them off. But often we don't know which ones are turned on and off and in what tissues and so forth. So what we can do using CRISPR is we can now start to turn things on and off in multiple cell types. And this allows for us to do a better screening, to identify targets for therapy. Another way that we can use CRISPR is we can start to change cells or tissues to express what we want. So one example of this is CAR T therapy. This is where we take T cells, which we know are very important immune cells, and by using CRISPR, we can change their ability or their receptors ability to identify very specific tissue types like cancer types, so that the receptors of the T cells are basically amplified, so that when you change them and then reintroduce them back into the individual who has cancer, that T cell can very strongly identify the cancer and hopefully get rid of it. And so at the moment, these are the ways in which CRISPR technology is being utilized. But we hope that in the future, CRISPR can be used to simply turn things off, turn things on when we need to, so that if something does arise, we can actually either preempt it or once we identify it, we can fix it. And this is CRISPR technology.